Okay, so this mini lecture is going to be covering just a little bit about a couple of the viewpoints on identity development in adolescence. So there are lots and lots of changes taking place during the adolescent years. As we've talked about, there are major biological changes that are associated with puberty. At the same time, adolescents are transitioning to larger and more impersonal schools as they make that transition from elementary school to junior high and then from junior high to high school. They're also starting to negotiate new types of relationships like um, new types of peer relationships and new sexual relationships perhaps, and also hopefully beginning to think about the future and making some long-term decisions. And all of these challenges um, lead to the adolescent starting to define who he or, sh he or she really is. Now, something that starts to happen as the adolescent is trying to figure out who they really are, trying to figure out their true self, is that you have the emergence of what we refer to as possible selves. Possible selves are perceptions of who we really are, who we are in different groups, who we are in different settings, who we would like to become who we're afraid of becoming. Oftentimes we're afraid of becoming our parents at this age, right? And you start to realize that you play different roles with different people in different situations. And so for the adolescent who's trying to explore and figure all of this out, they might show behavior that one day is very rowdy and then another day is um, really reserved and then behavior then ranges from cooperative to really antagonistic and this is sort of what makes parents crazy right during this period of development is that they're never really sure which adolescent they're getting on any given day but experimenting with these possible selves is important to identity development and those multiple selves are going to help the adolescent explore which of them if any of them is the real them the core the core self the core identity of the individual Another thing that adolescents may start to engage in as they're doing this exploring and trying to figure out who they really are is they might start to engage in false self behavior. That they might behave in ways that are really contrary to who they feel they really are. Right? That by adolescence you have a pretty good sense of self. We've already talked about it in early childhood and middle childhood, that you have a sense of what your core um characteristics are in terms of being friendly, for instance, in terms of being skilled in certain areas and not skilled in others. And so false self behavior is when you kind of go against who you think you are at the core, even if you're not yet sure who you are, even if you don't have an established identity. Now there are three types of false self behavior, ranging from less healthy to more healthy types of false self behaviors. The first type is the least healthy of the three. And it comes from the adolescent perceiving themselves, their real self, their core self, as being rejected by their peers and rejected even by their parents. And so the adolescent as such really starts to dislike themselves. They tend to feel worthless, maybe depressed, and so they are engaging in these false self behaviors to hide who they really are, to hide their true nature and to gain the acceptance of others. And so this is not uh, the most adaptive reason or way to engage in false self behavior. The second type, which is, you know, middle ground, it's not t fully healthy, it's not terribly unhealthy, but the second type arises from a wish to impress or please others. So it's not coming from a sense of rejection, it's just you want to impress or please others, and this is really common in adolescence as you try to fit in, right, with different peer groups and you don't have as many problems, like depression, for instance, as the first type of false self behavior is associated with. These adolescents tend to have a, a little bit more self-understanding than those that are um, behaving falsely because they don't like themselves, as an example. And then the third type is the healthiest type of false self behavior, and it's true experimentation. The adolescent is really just trying out different behaviors to see how it feels, and adolescents who do this tend to have the highest levels of self-esteem and the greatest degree of self-knowledge. Now, of course, in Erickson's theory, the stage that you are in during adolescence is identity versus role confusion. So the challenge is to integrate different aspects of your self-understanding into a coherent identity. Um, and identity is your self-definition as a separate individual in terms of things like your roles, your attitudes, your beliefs, your aspirations. And for Erickson, this is the most important task of adolescence and it kind of sets the stage for what happens in later Erickson stages. 
Now, the thing about Erickson's theory is that all of these stages are black or white, right? That you either um, fall on the positive side or you fall on the negative side. It's kind of um, pretty rigid. And so what other researchers have done in terms of identity development is come up with different um, ways of thinking about identity status. And so the next slides will talk about uh, an example of this. Marcia comes up with four different identity statuses that are possible. The ideal, the ultimate goal is identity achievement. And this is when the person knows who he or she is as a unique individual. And their self-definition encompasses lots of information like your sexual, your moral, political, vocational identity. And the only way to get to identity achievement is by exploring. That you have to explore alternative identities and you also have to eventually commit to a clearly formulated um, set of self-chosen values and goals. And so um, the, the way to get to this ideal goal, to get to identity achievement, is by exploring and eventually committing. The second type of identity status is moratorium. And if you think about what the word moratorium means, it means a delay or a holding pattern. And so individuals who are in moratorium have made no commitment. They are in the process of exploring, they're gathering information, they're trying out new activities, they're trying to figure out who they are, they're trying to find those values and goals that guide their life, but they have not yet made a commitment, right? So these are the individuals that maybe in college change their major five times um, while they're trying to figure out what they want to do. And so it, it's not terrible um, in the sense that at least they're doing the exploring, they just have not yet been able to commit to a specific identity. The third type is identity foreclosure. And identity foreclosure is when the individual has made a commitment to a set of values and goals, but they've made the commitment without taking the time to explore the alternatives for themselves. So what these individuals often do is they accept a ready-made identity that some authority figure, usually a parent, has chosen for them, right? So your parent says to you, you're going to be a lawyer. Right, and the individual just accepts that and goes to school and takes all the classes that they need to prepare themselves to get into law school and they go to law school and they become a lawyer, right? But they've never actually explored the alternatives for themselves. The last type is identity diffusion. And these individuals have also not committed um, like the moratorium individuals, but they're different because they also are not exploring, right? So they just um, are not actively trying to commit to a set of values or goals. They maybe have never explored any alternatives or perhaps at some point they did try to explore but found the task to be overwhelming or too threatening, um, but they're just not, they're not exploring and they're not committed to anything. This is sort of the, you know, the 35 year old man living in his parents' basement <laughs> kind of thing. Um, the next slide will sort of break this down just in the way that I've been talking about it in a little bit more clear way. So here you have um, level of commitment and level of exploration, high or low values, right? And so just to summarize what we've been talking about, if you're in identity achievement, that means that you are high in commitment and high in exploration. You've explored and you've committed. And if you're in moratorium, you're high in exploration, but you're low in commitment. And then for identity foreclosure, you have high commitment, but low exploration. And then with identity diffusion, you're low in both. And you could almost imagine um, that individuals could bounce back and forth sometimes between these different identity statuses. So it's not as black and white as Erickson's theory would suggest, right? So you could at one point in life reach identity achievement where you have a set of values and goals that um, guide your, your life and your decision making, but then something changes, right? Maybe you have a major change in in life and you decide, okay, I need to go back to school, right? Um, and I need to do some other kinds of things to continue exploring and, and make a decision at some point. So you might go back into moratorium and then go back into identity achievement or someone maybe who was in identity foreclosure realizes, oh, I've made a mistake by just accepting this particular identity and I need to do some exploring on my own. So it, it just offers a bit more flexibility than Erickson's original theory did.